The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Anyway, we I'd better uh, abbreviate all, all the stuff that I want to cover today. The next three classes are going to cover cases of very precise, very uh, complex but very direct relationships between social and spatial structure. <clears throat> There's a, a literature largely from the left side of the market uh, on these issues. I don't have time to go through much of this here. Um, you should read the required reading for this class, Kevin Lynch's piece, chapter on social and spatial structure relationships. Um, on, the, on the left, I would assume the, the arguments that space is an active agent, that it involves conflict, that it's political, and this is an argument that is articulated very well by Henri Lefebvre in the translation of his writing into English. David Harvey's first book, Social Justice in the City, argues that under capitalism, <coughs> investment will never stream towards the poorest sections of the society <coughs> because capitalism has so many circuits of investment. To m an object of capitalist investment is always maximizing profit. There are less attractive writings by Manuel Castells in his pre-Berkeley stage. The book, The Urban Question, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, there's David Gordon's writing about uh, the origins of American suburbia as being the result of labor friction in the central business area and the bosses wanting to move as far away from the workers as possible. And there are many histories of this kind. There's Castells' piece, The Wild City, which argues that suburbia is a form of advanced capitalist investment in which <coughs> you have to create markets for prolific domestic goods and suburbia is an attractive avenue for this kind of market. His writing is called The Wild City. He claims the American city is wild in the sense that it uh, obeys the uh, consequences of market action in a very obvious kind of way. Uh, it's not uh, hidden or transformed. Um, there's an enormous amount of writing. There's this writing and from, this, from the center and the right. Um, in Sunday's New York Times, there's a piece called Suburban Disequilibrium. Disequilibrium. I don't know if anybody looks at these things. It simply says that suburbs are unequal, something that one would presume to know. And the reason suburbs are unequal are given and they haven't changed, and not much has changed. She cites examples of suburbs close together in Los Angeles where 
in one a house sells for $68 million. And there's a few miles away, there's a suburb of Mexican-American workers who can barely afford to buy their house. Um, in teaching this material, I have found over the years that uh, the material is very much stretched to large ideas about economic science and social policy. Uh, there's very little discussion of the meaning of place. Um, Donald Appleyard has written about that and so some of others. Uh, what place means, what space means to people and, and so on. So I've decided to follow a different route in dealing with this. Um, I've established uh, a notion called bipolarity. Um, and chosen cases where the conflict between the various groups in the city is very explicit. And uh, under different conditions. So we will examine Johannesburg from its origins in 1876, I think, to today, following a path of explicit racial policy. South Africa invented or formalized racial policy to an extent that no other country and no other state in the world ever has. So we should look at Johannesburg and what the space of Johannesburg looks like as a result of the enforcement of absolute inequities between white and black. We should look at the colonial city. We look at Delhi and New Delhi. We look at the border between Mexico and the United States and uh, look at the polarity between country and city in the development of Havana. Um, to, today's class is really dealing with the mother of all social complexities, and that's Jerusalem. I want to do a case study on Jerusalem, and just for those of you who haven't read the required reading for today, which is a long piece which I wrote after months of work, and I'm so sad that you haven't read it. Uh, um, I'll go through these very, let me just explain what I've handed out to you. After this, the map of the history of Jerusalem, the simplified history, on the next page is a drawing it's a drawing on a napkin by the head of the, of, of the planning section of MOPIC, the Palestinian uh, organization after the Oslo Accords, which I worked with for a while. Uh, this was his depiction of the future of Jerusalem as one metropolitan area with two, with the Jewish sector on the west and the Palestinian sector on the right and the historic center in the middle. Below that is a letter which is obvious. Um, uh, pointing out the stupidity of some of the writing on this issue. So what I'm going to do is try to take you to a history of which starts off as a history of, for a long time, a history of religious consequence and transforms much later and in recent times, certainly in this century, into a geopolitical conflict. And we end up with a status quo. Um, let's follow this map very briefly. 
The origins of Jerusalem are again political. For Palestinians, it talks about the Jebusites and the Canaanites and the origins of the city prior to 1000 BC, which is at the date that <coughs> the Davidian city, the city of David, argues as its beginning. And David captures Jerusalem according to this. This is an Israeli map. Uh, according to the to Israeli history, David bought the threshing fields on the Temple Mount from the Jebusites for 15 shekels, the equivalent amount of money. And in order to unify the spread out Jewish tribes, he built the first, he's, uh, he was uh, a lover and a poet and a general and according to strict Hebrew law was not able to build a temple. So his son Solomon was the author of the first temple. I'll show you a drawing of, by Corbusier of the tribal environment which the Jews and most people established at that time. And the drawing shows the temple as the first physical presence in a city. Seeing that the religious city for a long time just depended on a religious infrastructure, it's clear that the first temple, this temple exists for about 500 years, uh, during which time it, the Middle East undergoes sieges and invasions. The most significant invasion is by Nebuchadnezzar in, sixth, in the 6th century. This has enormous consequences historically, and I uh, tend to exaggerate some of them. Nebuchadnezzar came from the world's greatest city at the time, Babylon, the most advanced city of all. Instead of killing the Jews, he took them back with him as prisoners and allowed the Jews to establish themselves in Babylon in a relatively free manner. Why he did that, which was very contrary to social inter international behavior at the time, I don't know. What happened was so significant for the Jews. Not having a temple, not having priests, you must understand the organization of the social structure around the temple. The temple was run by priests. There, were, there was no democracy in religion. You took what the priests gave you, and the priests were, were monitors of the Holy of the Holies. If you look at the plans putated for the first temple, you will see that structure. Um, the Jews didn't have temples. They either had to give up their religion or convert to some other pagan religion having been the first mono, 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 mono ethicists of all. Having f mono atheism was founded in Jerusalem. Nobody quite knows how, but the idea that many gods were dysfunctional and that a single god, an invisible single god, was the proper course for religious faith. So the Jews prayed in houses and in schools, wherever they could. This type substitution was an extraordinary idea. 
in the history of the church, I found a reference to saying that this was the beginning of the idea of the church. Free of the rule of plutocratic priests, people could indulge in a critical examination of their faith together as a group. In fact, the conflict towards the end of the Jewish reign in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus it was very much a conflict between the priests of the Second Temple and the Pharisees who were advocating a, beginning to advocate a democratic religion in the form of the synagogue. So the synagogue emerges in primitive form in the exile of a Jewish group from the temple where it, there's a second phenomenon which occurs during this period. In the Judeo-Christian Bible, there are seven chapters devoted to Ezekiel. Who was Ezekiel? What role did he play in the... You should know these things. You all are Christians or, or Muslims or or other, any other form of religion. You know nothing about your own religion. Maybe all pagans. <laughs> which would be refreshing, I suppose. He was a Catholic. Well, Ezekiel had a dream. He was a prophet. He had a dream that God and he encountered each other and he had instructions to, de de to devise a new temple. There are six chapters in your Bible on Ezekiel's dimensions for this, for this new temple. Imagine dreaming of a temple when you're in exile and des designing it in your mind as a text. Anyway, strange things happen. Ezekiel's temple, as I'll show you in the slides, has been re redrawn and reimagined from these dimensions over time. The Jews return, uh, the third significance of the stay in Babylon. The Jewish Talmud, the Book of Laws, has two versions, the Palestinian version, at least the Jerusalem version and the Babylonian version. The Babylonian version is considered to be the preferred version. So the Jews in exile established a culture which they brought back to Jerusalem, having been freed. And Ezra read the Bible to the people for the first time and they, according to the text, they wept. The beginning of the idea that religion is a democratic phenomenon is my explanation for the problem of Jesus. I have a rather eccentric version of the story. What happens, we, we, jump, a thousand, we jump 500 years and Herod builds, rebuilds the temple. He builds an enormous temple, bigger than before. Priests are again now in control. They control power. They control the artifacts of religion. They control property. They control everything in the city. Along comes a Jew, a radical Jew, who has another vision of the world. Jesus doesn't threaten the Romans very much. The Romans are used to dealing with all over the empire with infidels. They just lock them up or cut their heads off. Very explicit rules. Here they're in a rather difficult situation. 
the priests are more threatened by Jesus than are the Romans. The priests therefore connive with the Romans to execute Jesus. The notion of execution of your son occurs in the Judeo-Christian Bible before and although it wasn't legal, the idea of passing your son on as a gift. The use of blood, 22,000 oxen were killed in the dedication of the Temple of Solomon. The whole idea of giving something to God as a gift. If you were poor, you brought a, a chicken to the temple, to the priests. If you were wealthy, you brought a cow, an ox. If you were very wealthy, Lord knows you donated your son. The story of Abram and Isaac is that same version of, the, of that gift giving. The supreme gift is the gift of your son. And the Jesus story is, the, is archetypally the story of God donating his son again for the improvement of the world. The Christianity is based on many mythical stories which emanate from the history of Jerusalem and is the second monotheistic religion to emerge out of the city. Muhammad is born in 570 BC, fights his battles in Mecca and Medina, spreads the idea of Islam as the third great monotheistic religion through the Arabian Peninsula. And soon afterwards, Jerusalem is invaded by the first Arab group. Significantly, the Christians had chosen a site for their great church. Constantine's mother, Helena, from Istanbul, or Constantinople, drifted down to Jerusalem and is supposed to have selected the site where Jesus was killed. On the basis of that information, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built and is still in existence today, having been destroyed seven times and rebuilt. The Arabs arrive in Jerusalem. They're the newcomers. They, they ask the Christian bishop uh, about sites for their own mosque. The Temple Mount, which had been the site of the Jewish temple, had been razed by the Romans, and there was nothing left. For 500 years, the Temple Mount was a rubbish dump of old parts of buildings and so on. The Christians wanted nothing to do with it. In fact, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is, you, was usually under the Roman city, entered from the Cardo on the west, at least on the east, was closed and you now enter the Church of the Holy Sepulchre only from the south. On the east now there's a, the, the best candy store in Jerusalem on the Cardo. Um, so the, although the Temple Mount was only two, to use their phrase, two arrow lengths bow lengths away from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, Islam, the Islamic penetrators thought that the, that the mythological origins of the use of the Temple Mount were sufficient for them to follow the Jewish tradition of the destroyed temple. So they rebuilt the uh, Temple Mount in about 100 years after 
uh, Muhammad's birth and build the two buildings which are still there today, the Dam of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In my writing, I go through detailed history of the idea of resilience. How uh, under in these occupations, each religion plays around with the idea of permanence. The Christians in the, in the Holy Sepulchre never really agree on the fundamentals of the Christian faith. May, whilst they may agree on the fundamentals, they don't agree on its application. So 70% of the Holy Sepulchre is still under Greek Christian. The poor African Ethiopian Christians live on the roof and are not only allowed to enter the major tabernacle by a small staircase. Um, as one of the writers writes, uh, they are all divided by faith or something of this kind. So you have the notion of, a, of, 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 of the three major religions having, in the case of the Christians, an artifact which is houses divided aspects of the religion. There are fires, there are people killed, there are all kinds of dis disjunctions between these groups, but Christianity survives. On the Islamic front, you have the church, the Dome of the Rock and the al Aqsa Mosques, which survive to this day unblemished. In 1099, the Crusaders, under the pressure from the popes of Europe, attempt to re restore Christianity. Um, instead of dismant, they are absolutely ruthless to the degree that they kill everybody in their sight. They kill Muslims and Jews, and in the blood, of their boots, they walk to the Holy Sepulchre and pray. There's always this kind of biblical, in, in, interest, interesting biblical thing which I focus on also, that the interpretation of God is always ambiguous. God is always punishing people for doing the wrong things, but he's also forgiving if you come to terms with him or her depending on what you believe. So the Crusaders behave in this apparently bifocal way. They destroy everybody whom they see in, in their sight violently, and at the same time they, they go and sing hymns in their church. Now there may be parallels in contemporary violence as well. I don't know if it's a born-in instinct in humankind that you modify your behavior in two distinct ways according to your belief system. The Jews have lost two temples. They're now in exile. They take with them books. That's the only property they have. There's writers, Heschel, the American Jewish theolog liberal theological rabbi Mitchell Schwarzer did his PhD at MIT write about the idea of the Jewish book as the significant property of memory. They argue that in fact the uh, I think it's Heschel who talks about the Jewish religion as being a religion of the architecture of time. If you look at the layout of a text in the Mishnah, you'll see a body of writing, and on the sides are Talmudic interpretations by rabbis over time, so that the truth is never absolute in this one sense, that it's always open to discussion. 
It's also that the Jews took upon themselves, and Freud himself, who at one time decided, thought about going to live in Jerusalem, um, says that the Jews preoccupied themselves with avoiding pictorial imagery. You cannot decorate a synagogue. The text has to be absolutely pure. Jews didn't become architects. They were never in a power position in exile for thousands of years. Well, not thousands of years. Peter Eisenman, Eisenman is Frank Gehry, a Jewish, and I suppose that we've made up for all of that last time. Uh, but the Jewish presence after 70 AD was in exile until the slow return of the Jews in the Ottoman period, which lasted from about 1500 to 1917. Um, I hope you're following all of these detailed stories, but in a sense, it's only by looking at the details sides of these stories that you really get a good idea of the complexity of the situation. To say Arab, I mean, of the 3,000 years of the history of Jerusalem, 1,200 years have been under the Israelites or the Jews, and 1,200 years under the Arabs or Islam. Whatever that means. The rest is divided amongst the Christians and the Romans. Jerusalem was in the first place not a particularly important city. It was too steep. It was the main circulation path was to the, to the west along the Mediterranean. Jerusalem was the, was the last connector between the coastal plain and the endless desert which stretched all the way to India. The Dead Sea close to Jerusalem was the lowest point on earth. So there was, I'll show you a slide indicating this division, a geographical division on which Jerusalem sits. Alexander the Great visited Jerusalem. This was an enormous victory for the Jews. Many Jews, including my son, are named Alexander because of that tradition. His first name is Peter, and, but his second name is Alexander. I named him after the Russian, Russian giants rather than Jewish heroes. So Zionism as a phenomenon occurs in Europe as a consequence of the marginalization of Jews in Central Europe and all the way uh, to England and France, the disposition of Jewish land. The Jews under, under one of the early, I think, 12th century English kings had to wear labels marking them as Jews. Uh, the pogroms of Eastern Europe. I mean, it's a long history which precedes the, so, the Holocaust. Uh, and Jewish reaction to pun persecution and punishment took the form of a biblical notion of next year in Jerusalem. In the Jewish Passover service, there's this phrase, next year in Jerusalem. The Jewish Passover, unlike the Christian Easter, is not dedicated very much to a religious idea, but re re related to the escape under Moses from Egypt and God parting the Red Sea to allow the Jews to escape. How true that story is, whether Freud claims that Moses was in fact a Egyptian uh, who had learnt about, uh, uh, anyway, I'm, there are too many stories. 
when you get all of these people having been involved in this dialogue or in this multi-logue, you have many stories. The Ottoman Empire chooses to take the wrong side in the 1418 war and the British take over Jerusalem. They maintain Jerusalem as a mandate until 1948 when the is the War of Independence and the Jewish State of Israel is founded 70 years ago now. East Jerusalem is, is, belongs to Jordan, West Jerusalem to Israel. 1967, there's another war. This time the Jews, Jews expelled Jordan from East Jerusalem and in fact annex the West Bank to a united Israel. The United Nations proposes that Jerusalem be an international city. They actually have a dry diagram of the form of Jerusalem as an international city. Neither side, neither Arab nor Jewish politics accept that as a resolution. Um, the Jews start after the Oslo Accords, which presumably sets out that there would be an independent Palestinian state and uh, s talks about the 67 boundary lines and zones for the future states. Um, Israel politics, combination of rel religious pressure and uh, all kinds of other internal Israeli social issues, promote an expansion program which now has reached 300,000 settlers living on land, which is east of the partition line set by the Oslo Accords. Many American presidents, since Harry Truman, I think, have objected to Israeli settlement expansion with no results whatsoever. Uh, the status quo at the end of all of my long story of 3,000 years is a situation in which Jerusalem is claimed by Israel to be the unique capital of Israel, although, as you will read in my letter, many of the previous Israeli presidents have looked for alternative sites to Israel, to Jerusalem, uh, at least for the capital of Israel including Ben-Gurion's choice of Kornub in the Negev. Uh, the present, the Palestinian position is a slightly more complex position, but they would like to share Palestine, uh, Jerusalem as the capital of their state as well. So you have a notion which I don't think exists anywhere else in the world where one city is the capital of two countries. You get St. Louis, Missouri, and St. Louis, Kansas City. You have divisions in other parts of the world, but you have no claim for a city as being the capital of two states. In fact, the notion of two states is now under discussion. There's a new, relatively new movement which argues for the existence of a single state which would alleviate the problem of the settlements but deny Zionist ambitions because demographically the Jewish position is more vulnerable demographically. Um, this two-state solution which the United States and most liberal uh, politicians' uh, support is 
for there to be an independent Palestinian state. Uh, the Palestinians wish to go back to the 1967 boundary. Uh, there will have to be some compromise. God alone knows how that compromise is going to be worked out uh, between the size of the settlement population and the emaciated, fragmented. You can see in the last map in your handout, just in the case of the periphery of Jerusalem, how much this land has become parcelized in and fragmented rather than unified. My son's book, which tackles this pro problem much more eloquently than, than I can, argues that for a Palestinian state, which is liberal and not uh, imposing military law onto its, the Palestinians in the West Bank, and so on and so on, is probably the most coherent liberal position on the subject at the moment. The future of Jerusalem may well be never resolved. It may be the result of too much history and too much mythology. Mythology becomes history at a certain point. Let me give you an example. Christians at Easter today celebrate the way of the cross. They carry the cross symbolically from the praetorium where Jesus was housed to where he was crucified. The site of the crucifixion is not absolutely clear, but most people now assume it to be somewhere around where the Holy Sepulchre is. One of the stations of the cross, station number, I don't know what, number seven, I'm not sure exactly, is called the Eco Homo station. That's where the Roman legion commander pointed down to, to Jesus and said, Eke Homo, look at that man, look at this man, in a derisive manner, carrying the cross. In fact, history proves that to be absolutely nonsense, but a complete myth. Archaeologists say that the Eke Homo arch was only built long after, after Jesus' death and didn't exist at the time of Jesus. So the other conf conflations of, the, of reality, the Jews on near the, the citadel of David have the site of David's tomb, above which Christians claim the last supper of Jesus with his followers took place. It is now the site of the Domitian Abbey, which is where Mary was supposedly died, dormire, Mary, dormire being the Italian word to sleep, Domitian Abbey. So you have a vertical, as the history of this city has grown and layered upon each other, physically you have Jewish David at the bottom Jesus is next on top, and the Ottoman Empire and Mary's memory on the top. What do you do about a place like this? You fossilize it. In my letter in the New Republic, I say that it's not only a religious city, it's an everyday city in which people go to school, people have transportation problems, the Jews have just built a light rail system. Um, it's a political city. It never was the capital of any of the countries, Arab countries, that conquered Jerusalem. 
I'll show you a slide of Jerusalem only being the capital of the Crusader Empire and the Jewish Empire. What justification that makes for arguing that Jerusalem should be the unique capital of Israel is for you to decide. <coughs> this is the most, I mean, I can give you many detailed stories and versions of the, any of these events. Um, for instance, in, the, in a religious environment of this kind, it's amazing how frequently people build on the sites of other, of previous religious institutions. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is built on the site of the Roman Temple of Aphrodite. When the Crusaders capture Jerusalem in 1099, they go, they march to the to the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and instead of putting them down, they put a Christian flag on top of the Dome of the Rock and call it Temple Dominus. And the Al-Aqsa Mosque becomes Temple Solomonus. The Al-Aqsa Mosque was, as its foundations in Solomon's temple, stables. It is constantly, uh, its roof is constantly, its lead roof is constantly having to be repaired because its foundations are still unstable. This is the city which is built. I write in the last part of my writing on Louis Kahn's Chorva Synagogue. Well, if you haven't read it, I'm not going to tell you the story of Louis Kahn's interpretation of how you build in Jerusalem, his, his theory of ruins. So today, the Islam has three, two permanent monuments where his people can pray. The Jews don't have any. They pray in the open air. The holiest presence is in the Western Wall, which is Herodian in, 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 in ancestry. And the Christians still have the desiccated, holy place of the sepulchre, Christ's passion the location of Christ's passion. And uh, such, is a st such is an abbreviated story of Jerusalem. Now, what do you do? I've worked for the Palestinian side. I've worked not for the Israeli government, but for the mayor of Jerusalem over time. So my investment in the city is more than just knowing its history, which I only know partially. The history of religion is so extensive that to understand it all, I don't even understand who Gabriel was. He figures in some story somewhere. Uh, I mean, the books about the Last Supper, which talk about the tradition of eating together and what that means. There are books about the killing of your first son. Remember one of the plagues that uh, the Egyptians or God f cast on the Egyptians for their persecution of the Jews was the killing of the first son. That's why the baby Moses was hidden in the reeds. We can go on and on and on and on and on. Religion is a business which produces lots of myths and re realities and interpretations to keep itself going. Uh, okay. We should look at some of these pictures so you get a better idea of what this place looks like. The options are simple. 
This is the present Israeli option for Jerusalem. If this is Palestine and this is Israel, Jerusalem has a secure border on its west, on its east side. This is a metropolitan city as indicated in the drawing of the Palestinian planner with the central. The problem of what happens on a boundary between two countries in terms of security and customs isn't answered by one. You have to dispense with it. You can only dispense with that if, you're, if you have secure relationships. The European Union is dispensed with passport by virtue of an assumption that there is no reason to maintain fortified borders any longer between France and Belgium, for instance. But can you conceive of this being a solution in relation to pretty hard, two pretty hostile entities. How are you going to deal with security in a unified city? Small details of the, the historic site has, if an, if an Iraqi wishes to visit the Dome of Iraq, he or she has to penetrate some kind of line. Or presumably there's no line which is, has to be penetrated at all. This is a position where Palestine encircles Jerusalem in the, uh, in the counterpoint to this proposal. Are there any other possibilities? What do you think at the back there? Possibility for what? Hmm? Possibility for what? For the future of Jerusalem, given either one or given one, a one state solution, there's no problem. It's the capital of a single state. But if it's the. Another solution is a version of number one. that Ramallah, the United States and the European Union give a billion dollars to the Palestinians to build a new capital. It's like a question of where other people want them to put the capital. They want the capital in a certain place and where they're going to put it. For Israel, the same. There's, there's two sides of Jerusalem. I understand. There is a place to divide it, there is a divide. Without there being a political division, there's a, there's a community that's divided. The problem is that it's, it's an issue of security and to whether everybody from what the Palestinians can control who comes right up to the edge of the Israeli side, of the Jewish side. That's the problem. I don't understand. What, we, what I'm concluding is that there is no solution and that, the, that this will just perpetuate itself in history, causing bloodshed as blood was accompanied, accompanies the history of Jerusalem for two, three, three thousand years, that it will just continue to be. It is too intoxicated a sight by the virtue of the three major religions in the world. Forgive me if I leave the others out. That the, in, to use Aldo Rossi's term, the locus is such that it is irresolvable. It's a bleak future for both Palestine and Israel. Maybe there's a solution which doesn't include Jerusalem. This is the one which I'm indicating here. In which East Jerusalem is a suburb of another state, of a city in another state. 
but that's a far-fetched resolution. There's the West versus the East. The countries are Palestine versus Israel. The race, Arab versus Hebrew. Language, Hebrew versus Arabic. Religion, Islam and Christianity versus Judaism. Israel's relationship with the West versus Palestine's association with the Middle East and the Arab world. Israel's preoccupation with Western industrial growth, Palestine's developing economy in agriculture and in technical industry. The Jewish background of the Holocaust and the Arab treatment of Jews in, uh, in Arab countries, Palestine's heritage of colonialism, <clears throat> exploitation, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. They just tr travel the world of imagery. It's cheaper. Jerusalem, like so many parts of this world, Amman is exactly has the same topological structure. It's built on folded plains, causing valleys and hillsides and different kinds of notions of development. This is a more or less contemporary imagery. This is the holy old city here. Uh, this is the church of the, uh, the mosque, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and that's the Dome of the Rock. The, here in you, the, yeah, this is the Western Wall. This is Jewish expansion from the 19th century onwards, westward, Beit Kerem, and all the way to <coughs> the Jewish Israel Museum, the Jewish Capital Parliament buildings, and further westwards. Next. Jerusalem lying on the watershed between the coastal plain on the west and the endless desert on the right. Next. David's building of the city on the south. The city was always defensible on the south more easily than it was in the north. The Romans invaded from the north. This is a set of reconstructions of Solomon's temple over the centuries. Next. Corbusier's sketch of the Holy of the Holies under the nomadic tent. The whole idea of the, the temple is creating an audience of people in the, in the community in the foreground, but no penetration of the building itself. Jesus in Herod's temple is said to have exonerated, not, not attacked, but assaulted the sellers in the, of goods in the foreground of the temple. At a certain point he says, the temple will be destroyed in, after my death. He says to his associates, from then onwards, you won't need a temple. My body will be your temple. Here you have a religious substitution of the, the image of the body, the mass. In Catholicism, the use of the 
wafer to eat. Something refers to the actual consumption of, the symbolic consumption of a body. The wine stands for blood. These, these primitive and primeval relationships. Next. God is the architect. Augustine on the right, seeing God envisioning a second city up in the sky. For, for Jews, it was the second, the ethereal Jerusalem is about 10 miles up. For Arabs, it's about 15 miles up. Next. Reversion, a reconstruction of Ezekiel's temple from the six chap seven chapters. Uh, I didn't go into this, and I think we leave it for the moment. It was the notion of the invention of heaven. For the Jews, it seemed to me that early on, the God was Yahweh, heaven was above, but dead human beings were not part of the territory that should be taken account of. Priests wore gloves when dealing with dead human beings, like animals. Next. Herod's temple reconstruction, the great battle of the invasion of the Romans and the slaughter of the Jews. Next. The only map of Jerusalem, this is in Jordan in a place called Madaba near Amman. This is a mosaic floor in a church in Madaba uh, showing the Roman construction of the Cardo, the north, the east-west Cardo, and then the Decumanus from the Jaffa Gate running right angles. Next. This is the Eke Homo Arch. We're looking at a map of Jerusalem at the time of the birth of uh, the death of Christ. You'll see the connection from the Praetorium, from Herod's Praetorium at the top of the Temple Mount diagram along the, the way of the cross, all the way to Golgotha, to the Golgotha Hill, and the putative uh, passion of Christ. This is now set of this way of the cross is a ritualistic celebration carried out each Easter in Jerusalem by thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. Next. The Temple of Amphrodite, prior to the establishment of the church, the original establishment of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre has this various religious components, but it connects to the Cardo on the extreme right. Next. Here is a version of it after the Arab presence. The entrance now is on the south. Yeah. And its connection to the Cardo is truncated and stopped. These are various components of the Christian story. Next. The Christian faiths do not trust access to the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre and for centuries have endowed the, fa the Nuseba family, a Jew, an Israeli uh, Islamic family with the keys. Here is the entrance to the south. Next. Here's the roof. 
a Christian priest living on the roof of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in semi-exile, and years an Easter night celebration on the roof. Next. The establishment, first establishment of the Dome of the Rock, the circular purple building, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the south, and the many institutions leaving this part of the holy city to be the Jewish quarter, the Basilica of Holy Zion. Slowly there's something about the Armenian quarter here and the Christian quarter to develop further to the north. Next. The Dome of the Rock, the al Mosque. Next. The Crusader period for a relatively short time, the Temple Dominum, the Baptistry, the Temple of Salomonis, the previous al Mosque, not destroyed but maintained, only Christianized in a modern, in a simple way. All the Christian institutions which grow up under the Crusader, St. James Cathedral, the Greek hospice and so of the Syrian monastery, the Church of St. Martin, St. John the Baptist, the Hospitalia's Quarter, the building of the largest hospital in the, in, in the world at, the, at that time, uh, in the Muristan district, uh, largely part of the Christianic beneficence. Next. The retaking of the, the city under Arab Islamic circumstances by Saladin, the rebuilding of the walls, the walls rebuilt in 1131, 1191 to 1213, all of these schools and community places as a result of the Islamization of the space. 1917, Jerusalem prior to at the time of the British invasion. Next. I mentioned the example of the duplicate, the, the layering of the, uh, the David's tomb, the Domitian Abbey in the house of Caiaphas, one of the agents in the death of Jesus. But the Last Supper takes place there as well. Here's the Domitian Abbey, which has these three layers of the vertical space belonging to different religions. Next. The final subdivision of the Holy City into four sectors, the Dome of the Rock, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque penetrating into the Jewish sector with the Down Gate as its gate, the Golden Gate, which is not open any longer, to the Islamic section, which has the, the Damascus Gate on the north as its major uh, entrance, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Christian sector and the Armenian sector here. The Jaffa Gate leads to is the prime, if you extend these lines, the Jaffa Gate extends to uh, the Mediterranean, the Dun Gate extends down to Egypt, the Damascus Gate extends upwards to Syria, and this closed Golden Gate potentially extends eastwards to Iraq. Next. The contemporary city on the left, the coexistence of 
uh, tall skyscrapers on the west in the Dewey City. Next. The British occupation, the McLean plan, it's not very clear, but it's an attempt to recognize the Western part, the Jewish part, and developing it according to a garden city model. The Arab side is left gray. Reasons I don't understand. Restricted building and open space. Extraordinary plan. And the United Nations plan, which encloses a larger area than the municipality, it encloses Bethlehem. Uh, past Abu Dis on the east, including Hadassah Hospital and Hebrew University on the north east. Um, rejected by both sides. Next. Jerusalem's rulers from 587, that's Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, to 1967 AD, showing that Jerusalem had a consequence at a distance. The, 19, the 1967 dividing of the city in east and west with a boundary between the two. Next, the boundary taken over and a map showing, a map by protagonists of the Arab cause arguing that the Jews have always tried to locate settlements in a pattern which causes the city not to be unified. Next. Louis Kahn's, one of Louis Kahn's great buildings which are never built. And he's very interesting. You interpretation of the use of ruins in a city of, could you just turn on those lights, please? When you have the intersection of religion, politics, geography and history, you cannot do anything. It's frozen. I don't know of a situation which has managed to overcome, maybe Belgium. I suppose the, and the in, in Europe, at least the elimination of obstacles towards the creation of a plane of general acceptance in the European Union is perhaps the most modern example of the breaking down of barriers. The barriers are still between Algiers and Paris. It's between the hinterland of countries, Turkey and the European Union sending migrant labor back and forth. But this is a, a phenomenon which is not easily applied to Jerusalem. In the case of Johannesburg, you will see the absence of religion. It is purely a question of race. Once you eliminate religion and you only deal with race, you find it easier to resolve even although South Africa has struggled to the, to the, into the post-apartheid democracy, took enormous resources and time and bloodshed. And Johannesburg is an artifact of race.
and so on. So we look at these others in a slightly different light than Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is the great metaphysical city of the world. It's the most important metaphysical presence. What that means, meaning-wise, is difficult to say. There are parts where you tread and walk softly and slowly because you have a history of associations with that particular place. And these associations are kept very vivid. There have been Palestinian riots around, around the archaeology of certain regions in the olden city. Uh, somebody one day will try to excavate under the Holy Mount to see if the Holy of Holies is still there. Steven Spielberg's probably likely to, to do the movie, although he's done a movie which is similar. Anyway, any thoughts about all of this? Complexity is an easy evasion. You know, wherever I go around the world, hearing people talk about cities, the modern interpretation is they're too complex to have theories about them. And the, no city is more complex than Jerusalem. No city has been the site of three major religions. No city has been the site of uh, 3,000 years of invasion and succession, resilience and the building up of history and myths. You should go and visit it. That's all I can recommend. See if you can make any sense of it. You've lived in Jerusalem, haven't you? I've never been to Jerusalem. You never? I've been there a hundred times, but never once. Yeah. More than one night. Yeah. The, the first immigrant Zionists saw Jerusalem as an old fashioned historically bound city and leaders chose to make Tel Aviv the capital or Haifa the capital facing the Mediterranean or in the case of Ben Gurion the city of the, the new city of Kurnub. Um, Chaim Weizmann found Jerusalem to be archaic and medieval and the new Jewish Zionist spirit was in favor of novelty and social equity and some of the things which it hasn't been able to, per to perpetuate. Okay, we'll do Johannesburg on Thursday and see if there's any comparison.